In 73 AD, Masada, the impregnable mountain fortress in the Judean desert, stood as the final holdout against the onslaught of Rome's legions. The siege that followed would mark the final, bloody suppression of the Jewish revolt with an encounter whose awe-inspiring remains can still be seen in the desert today. Prior to the Jewish revolt, Judea was a minor Roman province under the administration of a procurator and under the overall control of the governor of Syria. The region had long been divided along ethnic, religious, and class divisions and was made even more unstable by a Roman authority which lacked the competency or military power to impose proper order. Simply put, the region was a highly combustible powder keg waiting to go off. In 66 AD, a local riot in Caesarea morphed into an anti-tax protest which challenged Roman rule. In response, the procurator Gessius Florus responded with heavy-handed retribution, plundering southwest Jerusalem and killing 3,600 people. The revolutionary spark was lit and the situation quickly spiraled out of control. A wave of communal violence surged through the entire region with the population of Judea splintering along its divisions. Amidst the chaos, the Jewish rebels drove the Romans from Jerusalem and eliminated garrisons throughout the province. This included the capture of the fortress at Masada by radical Sicarii rebels. The Great Jewish Revolt would last eight years and involve the personal command of two future emperors, Vespasian and his son Titus. Incredible amounts of blood would be spilled in a campaign that revolved primarily around sieges. This was epitomized by the epic siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which Josephus claims killed 1.1 million people, with another 97,000 captured and enslaved. While these numbers are dismissed by historians, they do attest to the intense levels of violence accompanying the fall of the city and the revolt as a whole. While the destruction of Jerusalem ended the organized resistance of Jewish forces, the fires of revolution still burned in the fringes of Judea, where the die-hard rebels holed up in fortresses refused to surrender. When Titus set sail for Rome in 71 AD, he left the new military governor, Lucilius Bassus, to conduct mopping up operations. Bassus took command of the 10th Fratensis Legion and marched first on the garrison at Herodium, followed swiftly by Hebron. He then swung the legions around the east side of the Dead Sea to take the hill fortress of Macarius, before returning west to destroy 3,000 rebels hiding in the forest of Jardis in the Jordan Valley. Now, only the stronghold of Masada remained. However, Bassus soon died of natural causes, and the legion returned to its new base at Jerusalem, before setting out with a new commander, Flavius Silva, in 73 AD. This force now marched south, intent on terminating the last of the Jewish resistance. Masada lies 2.4 kilometers from the Dead Sea on a barren, flat-top limestone mountain amidst a desolate landscape. On its eastern side, the summit rises 140 meters above the desert floor, roughly half the height of the Eiffel Tower. Here, a tortuous, zigzagging trail known as the Serpent Path makes its way to the top. By comparison, the western approach is more assailable, and yet even this side towers 80 meters above the surrounding landscape, the approximate height of the Statue of Liberty. As if natural defenses weren't enough, the cleared plateau at the top was ringed with a 1400 meter long casemate wall standing 6 meters tall. The wall design was such that it was actually made of two parallel layers with a central gap that could be filled with stones or dirt during a siege. Such walls were common in antiquity as they were cheaper and faster to construct while also doubling as storage space. In the case of Masada, the outer wall was 1.4 meters thick and the inner was 1 meter, making for a combined width of 4 meters. The walls were reinforced by 30 towers, spaced out for topographic and strategic reasons. These were generally 6 meters wide and 20 meters tall, with stairs leading to the top. The entire defensive structure could only be crossed at four points. The Snake Path Gate, the Water Gate, the Western Gate, and the Cistern Gate. 
As with all impregnable fortresses, the Achilles' heel of any defense would be access to food and water for the defenders. However, Masada was well prepared in this respect. Cut into the rock were numerous cisterns and reservoirs. Twelve were constructed in two rows along the northwestern slopes with a total capacity of 40,000 cubic meters or 16 Olympic pools. Buildings also dotted the top of the plateau with a series of long storehouses built into the northern complex. These could hold large quantities of corn, oil, wine, dates, and food supplies that would be preserved for long periods of time due to the naturally dry climate. Even if stockpiles began to run low, the open plateau area might be used to grow additional food. It's safe to say that a defensive force could expect to hold out indefinitely against just about any attacker. Unfortunately for the Jews, the Roman army wasn't your average foe. In fact, the Roman force bearing down on Masada had at its core the 10th Fratensis Legion. This unit of 4,800 men was a descendant of Julius Caesar's famed 10th Legion and was adorned with numerous battle honors. Recently, it had been blooded by campaigns in Armenia and was battle-hardened by the Siege of Jerusalem. This grizzled legion was joined by six auxiliary cohorts and thousands of Jewish prisoners of war. In total, Silva arrived at Masada with a force of nearly 10,000. Bunkered atop the fortress, looking down on the incoming troops, would be a defensive garrison of less than 1,000. Even this number is inflated since a large part of Masada's occupants were actually refugees. These women and children were certainly not dead weight, and could have helped with defensive operations under the guidance of the Jewish commander Eleazar ben Yair. Eleazar was an important figure in the Jewish revolt, and was one of the principal leaders of the Sicarii, who now made up the main fighting force at Masada. These troops were a splinter group of the Hebrew zealots, and whose name means literally dagger men. They were fierce resistance forces, made famous for being one of the earliest organized assassination units that would strike their targets in public gatherings before disappearing into the crowd. Such zealots had successfully held the Romans at bay and even defeated them in the past, despite being poorly equipped, and were not to be underestimated. When the Romans arrived in the autumn of 73 AD, they had no illusions that the siege would be over quickly. With this understanding, they set up camp on the western approach and went about securing their own position whilst undermining the defenders. First, the Romans targeted the aqueducts serving the fortress and diverted them for their own use. Next, they set to work constructing a wall of circumvallation. This was a textbook, Roman operation meant to encircle enemy positions. The fortification would ensure that defenders were cut off from the outside world and help thwart attempts at a breakout. During the siege of Jerusalem, Titus had failed to construct such a wall from the get-go and was harassed mercilessly by Jewish sorties. Silva was determined not to make the same mistake and put his men to work immediately. Using pickaxes and entrenching tools, the Romans quarried local stones and erected a 3 meter wall which ran 3.2 kilometers. This was reinforced by 8 camps and numerous guard posts. In addition, a string of towers helped shore up defenses on the more exposed eastern valley. This impressive network was built in a matter of days and can be clearly seen in the desert today. Silva established his headquarters on the higher ground to the west, along with legionary cohorts 1 through 5, while cohorts 6 through 10 took residence on the low ground to the east. The remainder of the auxiliary forces were then stationed in the surrounding minor camps, thus ensuring that troops completely surrounded the fortress. Now that the attackers had their prey cornered, it was time to close in for the kill. The Romans decided that taking the fortress by force would be necessary, since their own supplies would run out long before those of the defenders. But the question still remained of how best to assault a mountaintop. A quick storming of the walls with ladders was out of the question since any attack would be forced to advance at a dangerously slow pace and would be funneled through narrow killing fields. In this scenario, the defenders would be at a huge advantage and any outcome would be Pyrrhic at best. Typically, Roman forces would overcome such adversity by using siege equipment to offer protection from projectiles whilst artillery suppressed the defenders. 
However, the terrain at Masada was far too steep for siege equipment and too high for artillery. It would therefore be necessary to not only overcome the defenders, but nature itself. Ultimately, the Romans decided to turn the rocky cliffside into a gradual highway for an assault. To do this, the engineers would build an enormous siege ramp by taking advantage of a natural spur called the White Rock on the western side of the mountain. The plan was to bridge the existing gulf up to the walls with the man-made 20 degree incline. To support a ramp of this scale, the base had to be huge so as not to collapse under its own weight and was started roughly 200 meters out from the cliff. Here, the 10th Fratensis took the lead in construction while Jewish prisoners were used to bring a continual stream of water and supplies to the camps. Day in and day out, they slowly added more and more material to the foundation. At first the volume being added would do little to increase the height of the ramp, but as the days weeks and months rolled by, it only grew faster and faster. The sheer audacity of the construction project must have awed the defenders who woke up every morning to a mountain slowly rising towards their walls. However, as the ramp got closer and closer, it meant that workers were more and more vulnerable to projectiles launched from the walls and towers above. In response, the Romans surely would have begun to erect temporary walls and sheds to cover their progress. Additional archers and artillery may also have been called up to provide covering fire for the work crews and to dissuade counterattacks. Within two months, the ramp to the fortress was complete. It measured 220 meters wide at its base, rose 90 meters, and was topped with a 20 meter stone pier nearest the wall. According to archaeologists, this obscenely large amount of earthwork weighed the equivalent of one and a half times the Empire State Building. It is stunning to imagine that this was accomplished without the use of modern equipment. Now, a 25 meter siege tower was constructed and slowly rolled up the ramp. It was specifically designed to handle the angled slope and included a battering ram at the front. The tower likely also carried small artillery pieces which could be used to shoot down at the enemy walls which it now overlooked. It is important to note that this was often the primary purpose of siege towers. Rather than being glorified elevators for infantry assaults, they were actually meant to provide elevated positions for sniping at defenders and forcing them away from the walls while a larger breach was formed. In the case of Masada, the siege tower guarded the battering ram, which started to break down the walls. In response, the defenders set about reinforcing their defenses. When the Roman ram broke through the main wall, the attackers were faced with a second, hastily erected wall made of alternating layers of wood and earth. This wall proved far more resilient to the battering ram, seemingly absorbing every blow. It was however flammable, and so the Romans set fire to the timbers. Though the flames caught on, the wind changed direction and blew the flames back onto the siege tower, setting it alight. The attackers now faced the devastating prospect of having their equipment destroyed without having set foot within the fortress. Fortunes once again shifted, however, and the wind reversed direction, concentrating the fire back onto the inner wall. By nightfall, the defenses were sufficiently weakened, and the legionaries made preparations for a full force assault the next day. As the sun rose over Masada on the 3rd of May, the 10th Fratensis Legion stormed through the wall and burst out onto the plateau. Rather than being met by screams and shouts, however, they faced a deafening silence. The complex was filled with bodies of dead Jews. According to the historian Josephus, the defenders had accepted the inevitability of their fate and chosen death rather than capture. The grisly details of this mass suicide were apparently recounted by the handful of women and children who evaded the slaughter. More recent historical findings, however, have found discrepancies with Josephus' story and cast doubt on the final fate of the defenders. Nonetheless, the symbolism of a heroic Jewish last stand against oppressors lives on to this day and is a point of pride for the Israeli Defense Force recruits who take a vow never to let Masada fall again. The fall of Masada in 73 AD brought an end to the Great Jewish Revolt which had raged on for eight years. 
The land of Judea now became an independent Roman province under the administration of its own governor. However, the overwhelming use of force did little to quell the tensions which permeated the region. In the following years, the Jews would rise up twice more, only to be beaten mercilessly into submission with immense casualties. According to Cassius Dio, 50 of the most important Jewish strongholds and 985 of the better known villages were razed to the ground. Teaching the Torah was forbidden, and the province was renamed Syria Palestrina. This effectively marked the beginning of the diaspora and extinguished the idea of a Jewish state for the next 1800 years. Throughout the struggle, and especially at Masada, we were confronted with feelings of both great awe and sadness. The feats of engineering displayed by the Romans undeniably capture our imagination, and yet at the same time ring hollow in our hearts given the ultimately destructive purpose of these engines. For me, the siege of Masada and its 2,000 year old remains are a striking testament to the lengths our species will go to kill one another. As an admirer of the Roman war machine, this is a particularly important reminder of the field of corpses it left behind. Personal human tragedies rarely shine through the fog of history, and we would do well not to forget them. After all, one day, we will find ourselves in such books.